So as you said, I, I work at a Genome Sequencing Institute, and I'm currently mostly involved in this uh, project to catalog human genetic variation by very large-scale sequencing. Um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of information about where that's got to and, and, and how it's progressing. But I actually thought that it would be more interesting for this audience for me to describe uh, a method that I think is, we, we think is novel that uses whole genome sequence it's a, to, to take a new approach to um, the inference of, of human population history. Um, might be interesting to some of uh, I think the, the things that have been done in, that, in other, other ways previously. So I, I'm hoping to be able to talk about that. So people's genome sequences are nearly the same. Same as each other. Um, I'll go backwards immediately, which I can't. Uh, here's a region of about a, a kilobit, a thousand bases. That's a three millionth or so of the human genome. And there's a reference sequence which is too small to see, which is A's, C's, B's, and T's. And the dots indicate that these are the, also the genomes of uh, Craig Venter and Jim Watson, two um, uh, sort of influential and self promoting scientists uh, who've had their genomes obtained. And they're nearly all the same as the reference, except in this region in one place. And there's two points, really. First is that places where there are differences, of course, there are genetic differences, we know that, uh, tend to be shared because we have common ancestry. And so uh, mutations that have happened are sh shared by some subgroup of the population. So this is one place that's shared. The second is uh, the reference is a G at this position. Uh, Craig Venter has an A, uh, but Jim Watson is an here and there is an R, that's a symbol denoting AG, and that reminds us that humans are diploid. We have two copies of the genome. Um, and so, uh, in fact, Craig Venter has two A's. Uh, the reference, whoever that came from, the reference version has a G, but Jim Watson has one A and one G, and we'll, that'll come back to be important a bit later as well. So, um, DNA sequence, this slide I left out for reasons of time, but has, has uh, just improved at an exponential rate since the early 80s. And if you show the total amount of sequence, uh, there's a doubling time of about 16 months. And in fact, on a logarithmic plot, the line is not even straight. It's actually been going um, gradually upwards so that the, uh, scarily, um, the doubling time has been dropping. <coughs> and uh, um, it's now become possible with new technology to consider sequencing, you know, the, so the Human Genome Project sequenced one version of the Human Genome and was an enormous large-scale project uh, worldwide over 10 years or so. Um, it's now possible to sequence, consider sequencing many people. Uh, these are two kind of indications of where we've got to uh, that I've been involved in with other collaborators. Um, so using these new technologies that have improved uh, uh, reduced costs by a factor of a thousand in the last few years, um, we demonstrated that it was possible to obtain highly accurate sequences of individual people. Uh, this is one person, just over four million variants were found. And at places in this individual that were already, where the sequence was already known because of direct experiment, um, we found 99.8% <laughs> of those and the agreement with uh, genotyping methods was 99.94, and we uh, estimated a, a very low false positive rate. So that's actually there's a caveat on that. There are parts of the genome that are hard to access that are um, uh, nearly duplicative with each other or, or repetitive, and the, pro the accuracy will not be as high in those regions. But over much of the genome, um, the accuracy is good. What you're seeing in this graph is the number of variants found as a function of the depth, the amount of data collected. And we measure the amount of data in terms of depth. Uh, where you sequence is you get random bits of the genome. And so you're sampling at random, and you have to build up an average depth. And of course, there's sampling statistics. Uh, there's a sort of Poisson actual depth at one position given an average, average depth. And because there's two copies, you want to sample both copies, and you can't put, separate them. So uh, uh, at sufficient depth to know you observed two copies. And the sites that are um, both different from the reference can be found by about 15-fold coverage, but you need about 30-fold average coverage or well over 20-fold <coughs> coverage to start to find all the sites which uh, differ only one copy. So that's one set of observations. To get an accurate sequence, we can do it, but we need high depth. The second approach was if you're interested in variation in a population, it starts to look expensive to sequence many individuals at high depth. But of course, 
as I mentioned earlier, we know that variation is shared, and one can take approaches which uh, combine information, data that's collected on multiple individuals, and make use of the, the structure of the sharing. And there's a whole uh, theory and history and population genetic modeling of um, the coalescent structure uh, of individuals and how that varies along the genome because of recombination. But one can uh, uh, do inference in that, in that framework for the sequences of individuals having collected data from a lower coverage data from each individual. And that was, we demonstrated that approach earlier this year uh, with yeast, which has got a much smaller genome, uh, sequencing 70 strains. And there's a, um, with between one and three X cover, fold coverage depth of data per individual. So that's at a level down here where we'd have got very poor data uh, if we were trying to sequence one individual. But by sharing information, we can find shared, shared variants. So with that sort of uh, background and other work by other people as well, there was a consortium put together, the Thousand Genomes Project, to provide a deep catalog of human genetic variation. It's sort of continuation, or it's the next in line from the Human G Genome Project to find the reference sequence. And then the HapMap Project that some of you will know about, which uh, uh, studied variation at, at a set of two million known site, sites, which are known to be variable. Um, the aim here was to find, is to find essentially all the, the variants uh, that have at least 1% allele frequency, that's present in 1% of the population or of a sample, um, to do this in multiple populations, uh, and to find them with 90% power. And the aim is to produce an open resource which can provide a foundation for future human genetics. So we set a quick sort of update. We had a set of pilot projects in 2008. Um, the first of which was uh, a pilot for the low coverage approach. We took about 180 samples from, uh, well, there are four populations. These are the ones used in the HapMap project, uh, Europeans, Ancestry, um, Africans from Ibadan, Yorubans, uh, Chinese from Beijing, and Japanese from Tokyo. You can, because at this sample size, it's reasonable to combine those two populations in analysis. So we think of them as sort of three sets of 60. Um, and this is the depth of coverage per individual. It's all about twofold, plus or minus. Um, there was a second pilot to you know, drive the technology and the methodology for analyzing uh, a deep coverage and to provide um, uh, control data and comparison data across platforms and methods. Uh, I won't talk more about that. And there's a third project, which rather than looking at the whole genome, was focusing on genes and saying, can we more efficiently sequence a small fraction of the genome in a large number of samples, and I also won't talk about that. There are technical issues there. So um, we're just now coming to. Uh, there's a lot of statistical and data handling, computational issues in in, in processing the information. We have more than a, a terabase of sequence. That's um, the next thing, a thousand gigabases. Uh, from this um, pilot. The project as a whole, I think, now has more than four terabases of sequence. Uh, we've got um, the current state of things is about 17 million SNPs have been called uh, uh, based on the 180 samples. Um, previous to this project, there were 12 million SNPs in the no standard catalog of SNPs, of variants, uh, DB SNP. Um, and, uh, Eight million of those have been confirmed. Um, the other four million, some of them were probably errors. We all know that there are errors in the current catalog. And some of them may be real variants, but they're not variants that are common. So we're, because we think, we believe with this sample size, we're finding all the variants that are above 5%, or most, the vast majority of the variants above 5% of the ill frequency. So even this catalog here of 17 million will include the variants above 5% of the ill frequency, we believe, in Europeans uh, in each of those populations. Um, and then there's nine million or so novel variants. So we're effect, you know, roughly doubling the, the known catalog, even with this pilot. Currently, this year, uh, in terms of data collection, we're collecting uh, data on 1,200 samples at fourfold coverage each um, from these populations. So now from a, a set of populations in Europe. And the design has, has evolved into taking subgroups of 100 each. Um, which in some sense span a, a, region, a regional area of variation. And the, a number of arguments uh, suggest that that means that something that comes from, you know, e e even if it doesn't sample from 
Another sample, even if it doesn't come from one of these populations, uh, say from France, uh, the variation that's present in it, because variation, because the allele frequencies tend to follow climes or uh, vary smoothly with geography, um, variance at 1% in France will be represented you know, within this overall set. So uh, the set of populations in, in Europe are set in East Asia. Uh, in Africa, the genetic structure is much more complex and more diverse. We can't hope to span Africa with a small set of samples. Um, there's a couple which come from the HapMap project, and there's a couple uh, of admix samples from the Americas here. Um, the commitment is to extend this to 2,000 samples, so sort of 500 each from Europe, uh, East Asia, Africa. Again, this still doesn't complete Africa in any sense, but it will give us a better picture of diversity in Africa, and, and from the Americas. And the final uh, um, you know, design and collection of these other populations is still ongoing, so uh, new samples are being collected. So the overall status is that uh, between the, pilot, the various pilots, including the, 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 the sort of deep coverage of a trio, we're expecting more than 10 million novel variants this year, um, and it'll find the majority of, uh, or the, the you know, very large majority, not all of course, you can never say all, of accessible variants down to 5% of real frequency. It will also find many below that, we know, we're finding singletons and uh, low frequency variants. With data collected in 2009, we should find more than 20 million more variants reaching our original goals, and um, this will provide a core foundation for, for many future studies. So it's going to change the way that people doing association genetics w w can work. They'll uh, essentially have a candidate list of, of, of candidates. Um, we're not finding not just SNPs point mutations, but also indels and structural variants. There's a lot of work on methodology for finding those. Uh, we're developing methods for whole genome sequence-based genetics. But also, these populations, compared to previous lists of SNPs, um, there's a very nice ascertainment structure. We, uh, we sort of know what we've sampled, and we know how we've sampled it, and we can assign... Um, so we, we have a, a sort of nice clean set of, of data. Okay, so the second, so I think you know, that, that project is proceeding quite well, and there are a lot of interesting issues in it, but I wanted to talk about uh, this, this issue of how of estimation of the human population size um, history. So we all know that uh, the model for uh, the modern human population is that uh, there was a population in Africa at some time about uh, 5, 50,000 years ago, uh, pe pe modern humans left Africa. There had been previous hominoids who'd, or who'd left Africa that are now extinct. But modern humans left Africa about 50,000 years ago, and uh, there was some split at some point in the, in the following tens of thousands of years into East Asian and Western European and other, other out-of-Africa populations. And there was a bottleneck around this time, uh, certainly in the out-of-Africa populations, where so the number of people who left was small compared to the previous number, and of course small compared to current numbers, which are, are large, so there's been a, a current growth. And this is uh, a figure, and you know, there have been many studies trying to, to model this and understand what happened. And uh, an example is, is this paper from Schaffner et al. from the Broad. Um, and they basically fit a model that looked a bit like this, with blocks and with a whole set of, of parameters. And the way they fit those parameters was by uh, uh, taking a whole lot of summary statistics, um, and uh, uh, which they could calculate from uh, existing data, and then you know, fitting the model to uh, fit the summary statistics as well as possible, and the white and black bars are the kind of observed data and the, and the model data. And it's probably some sort of uh, crude, um, statistically incorrect, informal version of what Mark was talking about uh, earlier. Um, uh, and less crude methods have also been applied to, to, to this. So, but in general, these methods have taken data from multiple individuals, but as a small number of loci, uh, where people had, had studied in depth um, those loci. So we realized that you know, rather than that, you can consider uh, a single diploid genome sequence um, across the whole genome, and uh, in some sense, consider a, a small number of people, the limit of one person, but at a large number of loci being the whole genome. And the starting point is you've got two copies of the genome, 
and there are points that are different, such as in the, in the uh, Watson sequence I showed you, there was a point where his two versions were, were different. There was an A, and a, he had an A in one copy and a G in the other copy. So how do those differences arise? Well, uh, there was a common ancestor at some point in the past, at this biggest, and uh, at some point from which both of these copies of the genome were descended, and at some point in that descent from a common ancestor, a mutation occurred such that if you now compare the modern copies, they're different, they're, they're different from each other. Okay. So it turns out that the, the time to the most recent common ancestor, which I've shown as a green line here, is, is a piecewise constant property of the genome. So if we look at these two copies, we plot the time to the most recent common ancestor, uh, there'll be blocks where the, there's a common ancestor at one time, and then there's a jump and a block at a different time. And, and these jumps actually occur at some point where there's been a recombination event for geneticists uh, in the past. And um, the second thing is that if that common ancestor was recent, of course, the time available for mutation is low, and so the number of mutations will tend to be small. And at places where the common ancestor is distant, uh, there'll be more mutations, and so you see more differences. So if you go back, you should actually see clustering. The, these, these differences won't be uniform. They'll, they'll cluster on the genome. And that, that clustering, that distribution of positions where there are differences, the petrozygous positions, they're called, uh, reflects the distribution of times the most recent common ancestor. And essentially, we're going to do inference on that. And it turns out that the distribution of times the most recent common ancestor uh, is intimately connected with the distribution, with the history of the population size. So. So we're going to model that process, essentially. And we're going to consider um, a simple model of these adjacent segments, which is uh, derived from the standard coalescent model going along the, the chromosome. And we're going to uh, take a sequentially Markovian approximation to that, which um, McVeigh and Cardin introduced and has been the basis of a, a number of um, different approaches over the last few years. Uh, so what we're going to end up with is, is a hidden Markov model where our observation is the geno genotype sequence or the genome sequence. And we're just observing zeros and ones, basically. We're observing zeros where, think, where the genome, the person is, is the two copies are the same, and ones where there is, is a difference. And uh, the hidden state is the coalescent time. And there'll be jumps in the coalescent time to a new coalescent time, and the distribution of our observations depends upon the coalescent time. So, now, given that framework, how do we parameterize that model? Well, there are standard you know, key, key equations from coalescent theory. So the probability of seeing a, a, het, a, a heterozygous position, that's a, a difference between the two genomes, is just proportional to the, to the time, as is the probability of recombination. Um, the transition probability, the probability of, if, if you, given that you have a recombination, that you switch to some other time, depends upon the population history. And the population hist size history uh, is given by this, uh, defining population size, effective population size, N uh, of T. And we're calling that N naught, which is, there's a free parameter or, uh, here. Uh, so lambda T is really the variation in population size. And uh, this equation, which is a little, you know, it's not that complex, but obviously you're not going to derive it now, but it's a fairly straightforward, uh, uh, be calculable from coalescent theory tells you how uh, the probability of jumping from, from one time t to another time s. <coughs> and from this, you can derive a stationary distribution of segment ages, and that depends upon lambda uh, according to that formula. So this is our model, and uh, we're going to fit lambda as a free of t as a, as a set of, of, of free parameters. And we fit um, also an overall mutation to uh, re mutation rate and recombination rate, basically. Um, uh, which, okay. And um, note, so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to discretize um, time by into 50 discrete bins. So we've got of the order of 50 parameters, 54 parameters, I think, in total. Uh, and we've got observations over the whole genome. We've got, in some sense, three billion observations, but it's rather sparse because, uh, but of the order of uh, millions of, of, of points of difference. Um, here we're simulating this, this process. So we're simulating a, uh, a 
a set of times on the blue line, um, coalescent times, using MS, standard uh, package, uh, for doing this. Um, and here you're showing, we're showing our, uh, and then we're simulating data from that, uh, and then we're inferring back, and this is the posterior estimate for the coalescent time uh, shown in a, in a sort of uh, color scheme. And you can see we can track quite well, but not perfectly, the, the coalescent time. Um, we also provide posterior estimates of recombination events, and they're not, they don't match the edges as well. Uh, some of them match, match quite well. So we're less good at identifying recombination uh, parameters. But we don't actually have to match this perfectly. That would be saying we can estimate the correct coalescent time at a single place. We, we're just actually fitting parameters to that. So what I'm trying to convince you of is there's quite a large amount of data here to, to, to fit our, our model. Um, so here's, let's assume this is now a plot in the form I'm going to show you. So this is our, our um, function lambda of t. So t is given in generations going backwards, and this is uh, uh, an effective population size. Um, blue is the, what we put into the simulation, and red is our fit to it. What we're going to see is that, that, that there are not very many recent events, just with two sequences. Uh, and so we're going to have very noisy or poor estimates at this end. And almost everything coalesces, you know, uh, there's a maximum time of coalescence. So also at, at, at large times, we, we lose power and um, we can't fit. Uh, but we can fit quite abrupt changes in population size. So here we're, we're fitting a, a strong bottleneck um, at about a thousand or a few thousand gen generations ago, which would correspond to a sort of out of Africa type bottleneck. And this is showing that the method you know, has the potential to fit that. So we have real data sets. We've got a data set uh, Chinese uh, individual who was published last year. Um, this is the African that we published with uh, Illumina. Uh, these are both from the Thousand Genomes Project um, using data from the Sanger Institute. And that was an X chromosome that I don't think I'm going to have time to talk about. Um, so, so here th they are. There's the African in red the Chinese in green and the two Europeans in purple and, uh, and blue. And the first thing to see is that the, um, the Chinese and the Europeans show almost identical history. So these are really different data sets, even from, di from different centers. Uh, there's a bottleneck about, uh, this is if you have 25 years per generation, this would be 25,000 years ago. Um, so 50,000 would be about here. Uh, there's a, um, a milder bottleneck in the Arubans, and that has been observed also from in African populations from uh, um, uh, uh, mitochondrial data, I believe. So here, this is uh, an average population size of 10,000. This bottleneck, one, one thing that's different here is that this is going down to 1,000 as an as a, um, effective population size during the out of Africa event which is actually, I think, at the very low end of, of, of estimates by other methods. Uh, here we're getting a sort of twofold drop, which I think is uh, consistent with other pictures of the, the drop in the YRI. Um, but this you know, approach suggests that the population had actually gone through a, effective population size had gone through a larger uh, value here, um, which is interesting around the time of the uh, rise of anatomically modern humans, and it had been dropping for some time before the Out of Africa event, and I think that that's a novel um, uh, proposal. Going back behind there, there's an identical history in all populations, which is, is good <coughs> to see. Um, I wouldn't put much credence for reasons I explained about in, in these deep uh, uh, measurements, um, I guess, because of, of noise, essentially, or you know, low data amounts. Okay. This is to show you, uh, this is a bootstrap on that um, uh, estimate. This is just on one population on the Chinese individual, on one individual, the Chinese individual. Um, so here, each green line results from analysis of a sequence obtained by resampling or sampling with a replacement in one megabase chunks from the, the genome, so making synthetic genomes and resampling. Uh, the blue is the distribution of coalescent events that we infer. You can see we see a lot of coalescent events in the bottleneck period, which is what you would expect. Um, and then a dip in this region and an increase in, in, in this region. Uh, and very few, which is why we have no power uh, at, these, at these ends. Um. 
So there are other explanations for some of the, the, these shapes. Uh, this, this analysis has been done in terms of a model um, of, a, of a standard mixing population. And uh, so in terms of effective population size, and um, you know, we know that there are things that can uh, lead to distorted effective population sizes. Um, uh, so in some sense, in the framework of the model, it makes sense. But particularly one of those is if there's population structure. If, so uh, what I'm doing here is simulating uh, data where there was no, so you know, an obvious feature of this is this kind of hump that took place between uh, 250,000 years ago and 50,000 years ago. Um, something that would, an alternative explanation could be that the population subdivided in that time uh, into um, groups that stayed separate from each other. So it wasn't, and, and if there were multiple groups of, hominid, uh, of humans who were, who were separated, uh, uh, effect in terms of, of mating, then um, that would reduce the probability <coughs> of uh, coalescence during that time, and it would inflate the estimate of the effective population size, or inflating the effective population size. Um, and we can model that. So here we, we've, we've uh, um, generated a couple of different models of, of population structure and of you know, admixture back at the end of that period. We haven't yet been able to model the whole shape of the curve, but that's an alternative explanation. But even that in itself would be quite interesting to assert that during the sort of rise of modern humans that there was a lot of, uh, um, of population structure which only got resolved uh, more recently. Um, Yes, just to show you that this, this can be applied to other cases than, than human, uh, the Chinese Genome, in, in, Genome Institute recently sequenced the panda genome. Um, I suppose for reasons of sort of uh, national interest. And uh, we've applied this to uh, the panda genome. Um, and we get a different plot although there were sort of humps and things, they're in quite different places. Um, there's two in this case. Um, and they, they managed to you know, place a story on this uh, um, with essentially two, two periods of decrease, possibly one due to hunting. Uh, this would be, uh, so there was known to be a Pleistocene expansion It's possible. I don't know. I don't know much about panda um, uh, history. So, and then possibly another decrease due to agriculture. Um, but that's uh, yeah. So that's basically it. Um, I think it's interesting to ask. You know, how could we take this forward? And, you know, the natural question is. Could we extend to more sequences, more, more individuals? And particularly, extending this type of approach to more individuals uh, would give us coalescent events which were more recent and would ought to start to let us address actually two things. Firstly, um, uh, it, it could start to let us um, you know, look at more recent history uh, after the, the leaving Africa. Um, and secondly, it could allow us to have some power to get at, at uh, models of population structure. Um, the downside is that the state space explodes in a, in a very nasty way for this kind of complete model, because you'd want to parameterize the whole possible set of trees on, on and even the set of trees on four sequences, I think, is large. And then parameterizing all the branch length is, is, is quite a uh, complex process. And I think some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, approximate or MCMC type approach, um, uh, you know, would, would have to be developed for that, or s some sort of sampling approach. Um, but I'm quite interested in, in pursuing that line. Uh, so, overall conclusions. So first, we, ca we can sequence the high accuracy with new technology sequencing reads. Sequencing costs are still dropping. There's going to be a very large amount of whole genome sequence data. Uh, High depth is required per individual, but we can build a population structure, picture population variation by spreading the depth on, onto many individuals. And the Thousand Genomes Project is a sort of um, 
is driving all this forward and will provide a public resource with a very large amount of data and uh, a lot of information about human genetic variation. And there are lots of statistical issues in data processing and there's going to be a, a, you know, a really strong data set at, uh, for, for, for analysis in different ways. And in particular, a uh, whole genome sequence data opens up lots of opportunities for statistical analysis in population genetics analysis as well as in phenotype-based genetics. So a lot of the driver for this has been in medical sequencing in, in, the, uh, or in, in medical genetics um, in supporting phenotype-based association genetics. Uh, but I think understanding how genetic variation has, has arisen is going to be important as well. So I want to finish there. I want to acknowledge Hang Li, uh, who's been a wonderful postdoc in my group, who did uh, um, you know, developed and implemented and, uh, the, the model that I talked about in the second uh, half um, for population history, but also wrote a lot of the key software that's been used for aligning reads and, uh, and calling variants in the Thousand Genomes Project. And these are other people in the group. Kang Lee is, uh, uh, um, has worked on the low coverage uh, variant calling in the, in the Thousand Genomes Project and many other people who have been involved. These are other people at the Sanger Institute, big science. There are many people involved in making libraries and sequencing them and processing data and so on. And the Thousand Genomes Project is a big collaboration uh, with people, including people from Oxford um, and uh, involved in analysis and many other centers and individuals. So thanks very much. So following Richard is a bit of a challenge. My genomes are much smaller than his, so I'm going to take a slightly different tack. You may be worried about why you're sitting here when I'm going to talk about behavioral genetics. What you might imagine is something like this. This was put together by a PhD student of mine. Well, he might be a PhD student if he's able to actually do anything. But anyway, he's very good at doing this. It was, he found it on the web, of course. So for, there are two things wrong with this. First of all, it's not the right sort of fly. And secondly, it's in some sense less fun. But nonetheless, um, I'm going to try and explain to you what we do. So you've heard a lot about the setting, which is trying to understand how you get from the genotype of an individual, it's, say, DNA sequence, to its phenotype. That's known as in the field as the genotype to phenotype map. And that is the step where most of the whole genome association study work is now moving, now that we have the technology to measure lots of things about DNA and its friends. What we are less good at at the moment is working out how the one influences the other. And the particular focus of a group I work at in USC in Los Angeles has been to use, or is now, to use um, model organisms, the plant Arabidopsis and the fruit fly, which is really the one I work on, uh, Drosophila, to try and understand something about this map. And as part of that, we're interested in, therefore, measuring various sorts of phenotype. For plants, the phenotypes are things, in a sense, relating to age, things like flowering time and things of that sort. And in the fly world, things like age and activity are also commonly measured. So I'm going to show you just a few examples, and I'm going to admit right now that I'll leave out the last two, because I won't have time to do it, try and catch up a little bit. Um, and what I'll try and show you a little bit about is the sort of tracking-based uh, machinery we're trying to develop to study this sort of problem in flies. And in particular, we're interested in understanding something about simultaneous, real-time, 3D tracking of multiple flies. This may sound trivial. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute. I'll convince you that it might not be. Uh, I, I'm going to say a little bit about fluorescent reporter monitoring because that's an interesting problem about trying to understand how activity and gene expression are related to each other. And uh, I, I may not have time for the last one. We should say a little bit about the sort of statistical things we're trying to do to understand ind individual and group behavior. So the work came about, actually, from the most prosaic of reasons, and that was that Drew Grover and I, who have been doing this primarily, uh, he's now at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute in Janelia Farm in Virginia, and, uh, which is the biggest, one of the biggest fly neurobiology centers in the world. And uh, we got involved through looking at the fly labs at USC, who were using graduate students in shameless ways to measure what happens in activity monitoring. 
So what they would do is film things for minutes or hours on end and then sit lots of students down in front of the movies and say, right, whenever you see this sort of behavior, click. You know, that's what they do. That's why there are so many biology PhD students around. So what we were hoping to be able to do, and we've been, I think, partially successful only, is to automate, in a sense, that procedure. So just to show you what, how this looks, what you're looking at is a picture of a whole bunch of flies in a little environment. And there's, there's all sorts of things. This is a porno movie, actually, this bit. Oh, no. This is undergraduate persistence. This is the female in front and the male at the back. But anyway, there's all sorts of things going on here. You'll sometimes see these flies jump. So the flight paths of these things are not like a missile or an aeroplane or anything. They jump all over the place. And what we would like to be able to do is track in various ways the behavior of sets of animals like that and then learn about something about how they're interacting with each other. Okay, so that's the plan. So uh, we started from ground zero. Uh, of course, we're not the only people to do this. This sort of thing is done in other organisms quite a lot, in tracking fish and buffalo and whales and all sorts of things. Uh, the tricky bit here is the size of the thing we're trying to track. So there have been lots of devices for doing this, and these are primarily from a statistician's perspective or a uh, Calvin filtering type perspective, two-dimensional problems in a sense. They sandwich the animals in a space where they're not really moving in three dimensions in a sense. So there's one sort of thing. Um, the, uh, these are based, these have cameras looking at them in various ways and what you're doing is trying to measure elements of activity uh, through time by using these measuring devices. This one is called a DAM, a D-A-M, a Drosophila Activity Monitor. They cost thousands of dollars each and they measure what's happening to the flies who are caught in the middle of this little tube. You'll see the tubes again in a minute as they cross uh, a bunch of infrared beams. So this is a very crude way of measuring activity because you don't have identities of animals. You only have something about when the animal crosses a beam, you know that it's something was going on, but you don't know really what. And then there are the very fancy ones, like the ones from the... That's not really a very good picture of it. It's, uh, this thing is about this around. Uh, they're 125,000 bucks a piece, those things, and they have seven of them at Janelia Farms. Uh, the other ones are rather less expensive. Anyway, the point is there are ways of doing this, but they are primarily, in a sense, two-dimensional strategies, and they're not, at least as I've seen them, used to do tagging experiments. And I'll show you a little bit about what I mean. So the outline, I'm just going to say a little bit about how we try to do this, and it may well be that, I mean, we're far from experts at the tracking part of this. The tracking bit's not the hardest. The hardest part is, as you'll see, trying to reconstruct the shape of the fly, as you may have guessed. So I'll say a little bit first about how we try to go about this. So the, what we have uh, decided to do is to have a variety of objects that look something like this. This was the, sim the first one from two or three years ago. It's a ring of concent concentric cameras. We use six, typically, rather than three. Uh, but for some experiments, it might be two, and so on. And then the thing you're aiming at is the little tube I mentioned before. In that damn thing, it was going sideways. Here, it's vertical. And inside are the animals you're trying to track. Uh, and that's the story. So we're using cameras looking at the scene like that uh, in the first versions of this. So the idea, first of all, from each camera is to detect fly silhouettes. That's two-dimensional pictures from each camera. To use the silhouettes to construct a 3D visual hull of what the animal is doing. The tricky bit here is the real-time updating because we're trying to do the whole thing in real time rather than saving video and processing it later because it's a lot of video. Uh, then you want to do the tracking part. And then, of course, you want to learn some biology by understanding something about what the tracks are doing. So the, uh, this all, many methods to do this are around. The most common one is perhaps silhouette detection using some sort of background detection, background subtraction. And that's what's being shown here. What it's identifying is a fly from three different camera angles. So these are the little two-dimensional images that you would like to make into an image of a three-dimensional object. Um, Here's one where it's trying to make the images. Typically, we would be interested in a problem where typical biologists, if they can see you do something with two animals in there, they'd like to have 100 tomorrow, please. 
And we can't do 100, we can do maybe 5 to 10. Um, but this is what it's going to do. It's going to try to locate in each angle each of the animals. And then, of course, you've got to match up somehow who's who. That's a non-trivial problem. And then you've got to try and work out what those animals are doing. And that what they're doing part, of course, depends on the question. So that may be something like, it may be sufficient just to track the centroid of each animal, or you may need to do something more exotic to maybe infer something about how their wings are moving, because that's part of the courtship ritual. And you saw, actually, you may not have spotted them, but there were lots of wing movings, movements going on in that little video I showed you. So um, the way that we try to build the image of the fly is by constructing a visual hull. This visual hull has to be constructed, as I said, real time. And we're filming here at about 60 frames a second. Um, some of the cameras are maybe 200 frames a second. So it's quite a data intensive business. And uh, so well, I'll, I'm going to not go through it as slowly as the thing really should be done. But this is three two-dimensional views from three cameras. And then we want to put those together to make some sort of hull. And that is our reconstruction of a fly. Uh, it looks, I know it doesn't look much like a fly, but it will in a minute. So that's the aim of the exercise. And if we could get something like that, then we ought to be able to process the behavior of lots of things that look like that moving through time and understand something about interaction without having to do the laborious business of watching movies and trying to record things by hand. So that's the idea. So with three cameras, you can construct visual hulls that look a little bit more like blobs. So they're sort of flyish. Well, yeah, sort of. Uh, with six cameras, you do much better. You get something that at least looks like an aeroplane. It's got a much more sensible orientation. And it looks definitely like a fly. And in fact, you can determine from that sort of resolution things about wing movement and so on. If we had lots of money, we'd get this image. But that's not really going to happen. Well, it might at Janelia Farms, but it's not going to happen where any, anywhere near where I am. Anyway, um, so the next part of this is the tracking part. We've used a variety of different methods to try to do this. And this is not a picture I'll say much about, other than as a placeholder for a variety of different sorts of Kalman filters we've tried, which depend a lot on the assumptions about how the animal moves. So one of the bits of research that's ongoing is trying to have good models for the movement of the object. And that's got to allow for these nasty discontinuities where flies either jump or actually hover, which is another complication. So we've used particle filters and EKFs and other things, but I'm not going to focus, focus particularly on that. Rather, I'd like to show you that you can get some biology out of this and a little bit of maybe statistical uh, things to think about as well. So the example I'll choose is the one about uh, fluorescent reporter monitoring. So what we've been interested in doing is understanding not only how activity works, but how gene expression works at the same time. So there are several ways you can do this, and there have been some very nice papers written about this, particularly about the expression part. One thing you can do is to, if you want to see how the expression level of a gene is changing with time, you could take the flies, take a load of fly heads. It's not good to be a fly in this business. You take their heads off grind them up, and you measure, using microarray technology, the expression levels of various genes. You then do this to your population of flies, well, them that's left, a few minutes later, do the same thing, measure the intensities, and so on. And you can then plot of circadian rhythms in gene expression in these animals. Now, this is extraordinarily hard work. So one of our motivations here was to see whether we could do something like this without doing any hard work at all. So we'll see. So the example I'll show is using GFP, green fluorescent protein. And here you see a fly who's lit up green. And what we're going to do is track both behavior and the expression level of a gene by using that coloring. So um, we can use this to do all sorts of things. It's the people who invented this technology just got the Nobel Prize for doing it. And we're, I'm going to show you a simple application of it. So uh, what we would like to be able to do is to correlate gene expression with movement and behavior. And the particular thing we're interested in is aging. And we want to see how genes which are thought to be in the aging pathway are behaving as the animals age. So it's a very simple question in principle. 
So the setup, you have to have some way of seeing green, as it were, and so this is a, a wrinkle on the camera system. You have a different sort of lighting. You have different filters to pick up different types of colors, because you can color things red or green, and so on. And this, the sort of things that we're interested in, I'll show you just an example with two colors, uh, is, is something like this. And I think I'll just cut to the pictures to show you what happens. So up the, at the top left, there's a tracking picture of a fly moving around in the environment. And what you're watching is its eyes. So in this simple version, there's a single animal being looked at at a time. And we are trying to automate what's going on. The thing underneath is the trajectory of how it's moving in the tube. So that's the tracking bit. And then these two pictures here are what's being measured. So the thing at the top is the activity level. That's measured. You can measure that in many ways. This is a one-dimensional version, which is looking at the distance traveled per unit time. And you see that it has in it this very nice circadian rhythm. So this whole business is about time series analysis hidden in the background, how you identify periods, and et cetera, et cetera. But what you'll notice is this very regular behavior. The animals are entrained in dark and light periods. And that's what you see here. It's a 12-hour period. The thing underneath is the activity level, is the expression level of a particular gene that you're interested in. So you build these flies with uh, a trick which makes the green glow when the gene's being expressed. And then you get path like the one underneath. And you see, too, that this has some nice circadian pattern in it with a period of about 12 hours. So this is tracking over a 50-hour period, including, of course, through the night. So the question then is, what happens when you do this with genes you really care about? So I'll give just two examples, and then I'll skip to the end. So uh, this first picture is a particular gene called HSP70. And the, again, the style is the same as the picture uh, you saw before. The plot on the top is what I call my prof professorial trajectory picture. So what you're watching are young professors, slightly older ones, slightly older ones still, and then people like me. And you see exactly what you would have expected. So activity is very high and circadian at the beginning. And it's getting less and less as time goes on. And eventually, you're done. <laughs> the thing underneath is actually a rather cool picture, because what you're watching is the behavior of the expression level of this particular gene as aging occurs, now done just by filming the thing's eyes, in a sense, not by doing complicated microarrays. Of course, we can't do thousands of things at a time. We can do only a few. But here's one. This one is particularly important. And what you see is this uh, rhythm, rhythmic behavior. It turns out that the rhythm in this one is, uh, I think, 24 hours. And that is exactly what was estimated by the microarray experiments for this gene. And you'll notice another nasty thing at the end. Just before this guy died, there's this huge spike in behavior, which is an unobserved phenomenon, which is a real bit of biology. But I won't fuss more about it. Here's the other gene we cared about. And this is doing the same thing with HSP22. And you see the same professorial trajectory. And here, though, you see a very different period. The period in this one is estimated at 18 hours, and in the microarray experiments, 17.8. So it's a nice intrinsic bit of circadian behavior, which we're able to measure just by this very simple technique. I say it's very simple because I don't have to make the transgenic flies that glow when they have to. Uh, we just get to film them and sort out the, the easy bit. So, right, I'm going to skip through things. So, of course, you may imagine that if you've done this for a single fly, you can do it for lots of them. That turns out to be more of a challenge than you think. And, it, in fact, you can do something about that. So we can do things like following the same fly tagged with two colors simultaneously. So you get simultaneous gene expression, and I'll show you just one picture of that. Another nice time series problem. Um, and we can also track um, multiple flies, and we can keep track of ones where you don't detect fluorescence as well. So this is a rather different system for tracking where you're using visible light to actually follow the flies and using different parts of the cameras and filters to track the red and green expression levels. So it's a lot more complicated after, well, before the event. Uh, this is what we should have been doing all along, but such, such is how it works. So um, this is to quote my president, uh, Obama. 
you've probably forgotten this, but that's how he got elected with that phrase. Anyway, um, so what we're watching is um, different wavelengths, so different excitation systems, different bulbs, basically. And we're going to follow simultaneous behavior of several genes. So I'll show just a couple of examples. So the, uh, the top one is showing, this is three flies simultaneously followed in the, at one of those little tubes, each doing their own thing. The blue tracks are the control sort of fly. That's this picture at the top. The HSP70s are the green ones. That's, I think, the brownie colored one is HSP70. And the black one is another. So what you see, again, is just a device for measuring circadian patterns. The top is activity. The bottom is um, in GFP intensity. And what you're able to see there is the same sort of rhythmic behaviors, periods of, uh, what was it, 12, 24, and 18, I think I said. So again, we can do now do this simultaneously. So that allows you to also measure, in principle, interaction between things. Uh, there's one. This is an example where we're tracking two flies in the same thing. One who's uh, do, uh, one who's labeled is showing red for HSP 22, and another one that's showing green for HSP 70. And what I'm showing you are the plots of the two simultaneously. Um, so these are the same. Yeah, well, enough. Uh, so the the strange thing you'll notice you get here is looking at this picture. This is a, a phenomenon familiar to microarray analysts. It's usually called the dice watt problem. So red and green emit, typically the green signals are stronger than red signals in these experiments. And so we observe this, what is of course called fly swap, because it's full of puns. The fly swap experiment is where you label a fly one way around, one gene's green, the other one's red, and vice versa. But you get the same assessment of the behavior, of course, and the rhythmic behavior as you would allowing for the dice swap. So here you do have to do some time series analysis to try and line up these trajectories, and we've got some methods for doing that sort of thing. So I think I need to end. So I'm going to skip over the rest because you need to hear the last talk. So let me just get rid of this. Um, we made just uh, the other day a nice discovery about how courtship works. And in fact, we were able to identify this, is a very, this technology may look rather clumsy, but in fact, you can do very precise experiments with it. So we were able to identify six particular neurons in the fly brain which are controlling circadian rhythms and courtship behavior simultaneously. So it's a very nice sort of experimental setup. It involved lots of people and lots of work, but it has a nice tracking aspect to it. Uh, and we're able to say, in fact, why we think these neurons are doing this and so on and so on. So it seems to be a genuine bit of nice biology that has come from this nice combination of sort of time series -y problems with some technology for how to measure things by tracking methods. So I'm not really allowed to say very much about it, but it's such a cool result, I put a little bit up there. And uh, so it, it, in other words, there is, this thing doesn't just get you simple things like behavior. You can do very careful, specific experiments with it. So let me just move to the end bit. Okay, so let me just end with this. So where does this go? Uh, this problem turns out to be a lot harder than we thought it was. And this was really done by one student's PhD thesis, is what you've just been looking at. Uh, we've been trying to do this with more sophistication in the last six months or so, with two or three more people, and I'll mention them at the end. But some of the issues are that we've addressed or are addressing are things like better silhouette detection, trying to use GPU-based algorithms for detecting silhouettes, particle filters and parallel implementations, and fusses about whether you keep track of single particles for single flies or how many and how they're correlated if they're not that way, and so on. So we're uh, interested in doing more of that, and some of it's been implemented already. The statistical aspects are the sort of information you really need to track behavior. I didn't show you an example of how we follow courtship, but that's to do with ring, wing uh, raising, and that you have to be able to identify in the films, in the tracks. So we can do that. Um, the big problem here, of course, is, as you might have guessed, label switching and how you know whether you're still tracking the same animals at the right time. That we've been working on. The technical aspects of this are brutal. The nasty part is trying to understand how to build the right sort of lighting to get these things to work easily. The problem, and it's typified by this sort of shape, 
is uh, shadows and occlusions that you don't really want. So this, it turns out, to be quite tricky. Uh, and then usability is the last part. If you want the fly guys to actually do this, they will clamor for GUIs that make it easy to do. Because to run these things, although it may not look like it, there are lots of parameters that have to be tweaked to get things to track well, et cetera, et cetera. You can guess what's happening. And so there's a lot of, we're doing a lot of work to try and make this accessible to more of our biology buddies. So there's well, lots of people involved in this. Ravi Prakash and Reza Adekani are the current guys. They are from the fly vision, well, they're from computer vision and movie business, but they're working on the fly end of it. The experimental labs are Michelle Arbeitman, Sergei Nuzhdin, and John Tower, and lots of their postdocs and students who've been involved in how to do this. And finally, if you're interested in more details, we have a website in which you can see the, the ghastly trauma in trying to actually get these things to work. So um, with that, um, I'll end by just showing this, uh, which is a current incarnation of a GUI with the right sort of tweakers to get things so that you can control how it's tracking as you're going along and so on. Anyway, with that, uh, thank you very much indeed. So uh, what I'm going to talk today is a project that I have with Petr de la Portas at University of Athens. And as like Carlo said, um, we are trying to track the problem of regressing multivariate Y with a multivariate X. Um, uh, in recent years, actually, I work like, on, on this kind of problem with the Sylvia Richardson as well. Um, what people are trying to do is to have a parsimonious representation of big data set. It could be, uh, as we heard before, uh, genotype or um, intermediate phenotype like uh, gene expression, proteomics, or metabolomics data. There has been like many methods around for many years. Like for instance, for dimension reduction, we could have latent factor models or um, principal component analysis, or like if you want to regress a principal component regression. There has been like a clustering methods for try to find like um, a representative uh, intermediate phenotype, or people have used like a graphical model. What we try to do in this project is like a combining the idea of clustering and the regression model together. Uh, the results that we have and we present later on is uh, not the, uh, is a work in progress, and we are waiting for the biologist uh, to give us like uh, some uh, feedback about the results. Uh, in general, all the results obtained by the statistical methods uh, drive like the hypothesis of two biologists. It's not like the precise results. So as I said, uh, we have a statistical object, and the statistical object is to uh, create like a regression model, multivariate regression model, for multiple uh, response um, using um, a parsimonious uh, representation. So we want to focus on a specific uh, uh, covariate. And we want also like uh, to uh, reduce the dimension of the problem using um, uh, uh, mixture models. Uh, and using mixture models at the uncertainty of the group, we want to model like in a precise way, uh, and I do like in a Bayesian setup, uh, uh, so allow like uh, the number of components and number of group to be unknown. So this is like uh, the, what people have done, the data that they have, what is like our uh, aim of the project. But when I start to talk with biologists a couple of years ago, they are in particular uh, interested in what they call QTL problems, which change the name according to which is the intermediate phenotype. For instance, they have a big data set of intermediate phenotype which could be represented by uh, uh, transcriptomics, and they want like, uh, to understand which is the predictor that predicts the, the variation of gene expression. In this case, they call like EQTL analysis. But you can have also like a proteins level, and they call like a PQTL or metabonomics. In, in this particular talk, I will present some few results related to proteomics analysis. Well, the biologists, moreover, are not just interested on, on see which is what cause what. They want also to understand if a particular intermediate phenotype, for instance, a particular gene or a particular uh, compound measure like uh, on uh, max spectrometry, is regulated by many genes, by many SNPs, and this is called a polygenic control, or uh, the way around, uh, the same SNP uh, will predict the many, many intermediate phenotypes. And this is very important because they call it a uh, hotspot. Uh, as you can understand, with all this kind of data, you have a lot of redundancy because, for instance, uh, it's not good like, uh, to look at the relationship between the SNPs and every single gene at a time because the genes can be like, in, the same, in the same pathway. 
the same problem arise like for metabolomics or proteomics because the same peaks can measure the same compound. So it's better like to have like an idea of how to reduce the dimensionality for the intermediate phenotype. So now I'm gonna to present what is the data. So this is an experiment, um, a data that comes from a pharmaceutical company. Uh, this is like, uh, I tried to plot all together, this is the log transformation of the mass spectrography proteomics data. The number of subjects that we have is 38, and this is the variation of the mass spectrography uh, proteomics data uh, for the 48 subjects. Uh, you can see the same things, even like in the heat map, probably is much easier to understand. So what you have here is uh, uh, a matrix, which is the number of individuals and the number of uh, uh, protein beans, because this signal has been discretized in 2006 uh, beans. So this represents for us the big Y matrix. Also we have the big X matrix, as you can understand, uh, actually, this matrix was much larger, but uh, we reduced like the dimensionality at the beginning uh, using like a candidate gene study, genome-wide uh, scan. However, even here, we have 5,000 predictors and the same number of observation. Moreover, since this is a particular problem because individuals had an elevation, some individuals had an elevation of a protein in the liver called ALT, some of them has a disease status, uh, which is positive, so they have elevation of ALT, some are not. So you have a third variable, which is like a uh, binary variable, which is the disease status. So overall, what you have is, is this. This is the data that like uh, the pharmaceutical company gave us. So this is the proteomics data, tr log transform. They want like to understand which is the predictors that predict like the variation in proteomics. Moreover, they give us also this data set, which is like the subject who have uh, an elevation of this ILT. So you can write quite easily the regression equation in this way. As I can stand, you have a number of uh, association which is 5,000 times uh, 2007. So this is the number, if you want to perform one by one, the number of, of t-tests. So now I'll give you like some, some idea why we try to, to, to simplify the problem. So for instance, if you take, as I said before, the, the uh, Y matrix, which is the proteomics data, and you perform a simple um, a clustering analysis, you can see that many of these uh, uh, proteomics uh, are clustered together. Um, of course, here I fix basically the level of the cutoff for the clustering, so it's not like uh, allowing like a non number of, of, of groups, but you can imagine that there is like a quite strong group here. So this strong group can be, for instance, collapsed. And instead of working with uh, uh, I don't know, 100, you can just work with a representative of this. Well, I, I do another thing, but it, this is quite instead new. So this is the simple t-test of the association between the, two, the, two, two, uh, the 5,000 SNPs and the 206, 206 proteomics beans. This is like the, the beta, actually, and this is the variation of the beta. But actually, you can perform the same analysis as before, uh, uh, probably the majority of the dots here that is basically all seems like yellow are near zero. So that means that there is no association between these particular SNPs and this particular uh, proteomics beam. If you do like a radical cluster again, you can see that the majority of them are equal to zero, or like this is the class of element that is equal to zero. Here instead is just the only group that are like a, um, shows some relationship between the SNPs and the proteomics beam. So the idea is, since we can cluster both like the Y and the beta, why don't you use this like in a hierarchical Bayesian model? So the model strategy is the following. Uh, we use like a special Bayesian regression model to reduce like the dimensionality of the problem from N times Q to a problem which is instead of the dimension N times KY, with, with KY is the unknown number of components. So we collapse basically the number of proteins, beans, to a, a number KY, and, and I will tell you later on. So we reduce like uh, the dimension from Q to, to KY. Moreover, we perform on the set uh, obtained of dimension N times KY, a multivite regression model, but then we use like uh, for the beta coefficient uh, a partial exchangeable prior rather than a uh, independence prior or G prior that I use like uh, with, with Sylvia. And this is much better because in this way, here we reduce the dimension tidy of a problem, but here we can cluster the effect of this SNP on, on the new set. Uh, 
it doesn't move anymore. Why, I don't understand. Huh. Preview. Uh, okay, let me try. Okay, so now uh, what it comes later is just techni technical element. This is like what is like uh, I meant by the model strategy. This is the original data set, and we want to regress uh, this original data set with this uh, set of covariates. But instead of working with this set of, of, of proteomics, we basically reduce the, the system uh, in terms of uh, 2007 to a number of uh, KY. And then we regress the new set that we create, which we call like uh, the cluster proteomics, uh, to our the set of, of the SNPs. And we obtain the new set of predictors, of, of uh, coefficient for the predictors, and we cluster also the beta coefficient in terms of uh, uh, partial exchangeable model in order to see which is the effect and how they cluster. So we can in, in, uh, guess which is the importance of every single SNPs. So this is like uh, what we aim to do, and to do that we, we, we use extensively uh, mixture model, uh, uh, and in particular we use mixture model for Y, and we use mixture model for beta. In particular, now I'm gonna to, to, to name many times Peter Green about like uh, all the work that he has done in on mixture model, and just like I show you like which is the extension that we made in order to, to deal with this problem. So first of all, we have the data Y, right? Uh, and, and this is the X, which is like our, our uh, predictor. So we model every element YI, so this is the, the individual goes from one to N. We model every individual, this is L is going from, from one to Q, which is like the proteomics bin. So we model every observation with a mixture model. Uh, this is like the, the, the usual representation. Uh, uh, Given that we have like a prior for the number of elements of, of, of groups, which is KY, we have the uh, probability associated for every single group, uh, and we model this with a Dirichlet uh, distribution. Uh, we have uh, the uh, uh, variance of the component, which is modeled like a gamma, and following like uh, uh, Richardson and Green, we put in a, a higher level of hierarchy for all the gammas. But here like, comes the main difference with respect to, to Peter and, and Sylvia work, because what they have done is uh, uh, the center of components, which is mu g, uh, the prior were fixed. So they have a prior, a, a, a fixed value here and a fixed value here. And in particular for the variance of this prior, they fix like uh, looking at the range of, of the data. Since we want to link the mean of the components with the regressor, this is like the main idea of the paper, so what we do is like uh, the, the prior for mu g for the center of components is given by the regressor. And this is like the error variance. So basically from this equation, you can see what we aim to do. So we, instead of modeling the regression between y and x, we model the regression, the regression between the mean of the components, mu g, with respect to the predictors. Okay, so uh, this is like the idea. Um, I, I want just like to say that like, is everything like a full condition? Like it's exactly, on the same uh, um, on the same type of, of a full condition that like it was in the paper by Sylvia and Peter, the only like uh, a change is like the center of component, which is like a more more complicated. But like the update is the same. Well, now it starts like a big problem because, uh, as I said, uh, we have basically. Oops, uh, this is quite important. Uh, what we have is um, how to do it. Yeah. So what we do is. We have like a mixture for every y, so we have 48 y, uh, i. So for every i, we have a mixture. But we don't want that for every i, i they have a different number of components. So the, the trick that we use and found quite, quite interesting to use is uh, to, to fix basically uh, the number of components equal for every i. So if we fix uh, that, we impose that like the number of components is equal for every i, for every individual. Uh, uh, so instead of uh, performing 48 reversible jumps, and, and then probably there was like a different number of components for every i, we have just one reversible jump, so which is similar to Peter and Sylvia. Our habit is a little bit more complicated for some reason. First of all, because this is like the, the acceptance of the reversible jumps is the product over the, the, the i individual from one to n. And there was another problem, which is I tell you now, it's like there is another element which changed the dimensionality uh, in the reversible jumps. 
Uh, and this is the new part. So what is changing dimensionality uh, is also like on the beta. So when you change the, the number of, of groups uh, for, for the proteomics data, for, for the number of groups in, in the Q um, proteins bin, uh, you use like the same idea of splitting and merging as in Peter and Sylvia. Moreover, you have an extra element which changes the dimension. And this is quite clear when, when you see like uh, the, the central component and this is like the, the beta for the central component. So to do that, instead of uh, uh, using like a, a, a random split, we have just a simple idea, which is like used many times by, by, by Petros. So we, we propose instead of for every, for every group that we have for the new groups, we propose like a split, which is like a, a, um, an independent sample. So since we have independent sample, it doesn't go into, into the uh, Jacobian of the acceptance rate. Uh, okay, so this is like the first part. So we reduce the dimensionality of, of the Y matrix using a mixture model, imposing that like the number of components is exactly the same for all the individuals. This is quite good acceptance rate, and this is the number of components, what we found. So as you can see here, probably there is like a group, like the, the optimal number of, of elements is between four, five, six, and seven. Uh, the mixing is quite well. Uh, wh why I like I, I, I indicate exactly this? Because now this is like a, one of the most important picture. Instead of working with the n times Q, now we work in terms of n times the number of components that we, we found. Uh, and uh, this is the first basically component order respect to the mean, and the second, the third, the fourth. And this is like one of the possible outcomes that we have like during the exploration. Uh, the, the mode was around uh, six. So this is like what you can see uh, instead of working with the Q outcomes with, with like the collapsed one. So basically we work now as, as the uh, outcome not anymore with the proteomics data, but with a representative of the proteomics data, which is the mean of the component. Given that, now, as you can understand, I can quite skip quite like all the details. Now the new regression equation is not anymore y, okay, but it's mu g. So we regress mu g with respect to the, to the, uh, to the predictors. As I said before, instead of uh, putting like independence prior here, we want also like to understand which is the role played by every SNP, so instead of using like independence prior for every SNP, we use like a, 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 a partial exchangeable prior. Uh, again, this is a nice paper by Peter and Agostino Nobile, which we found like quite interesting to apply. Um, again, like we introduce like two main differences. Uh, if you see like a, the paper by Peter and Agostino, uh, one of the most difficult things like to, to fix is the distance between groups, because now we are working on distance between parameters, not anymore distance between observation. So we, you have like to, to fix what is called discrepancy parameter, uh, um, and actually in the paper by, by Peter, they fix it in some way. Uh, we, we, with Petros, we change this idea. So we allow like the discre discrepancy parameters to be random. I'll show you like immediately the, how we, we did it. And moreover, we introduce an over change. In particular, uh, this is the center of a component for, for instance, the first row of betas. Uh, but since I told you before that we are also interested on the, uh, on the hotspot effect, we link all the component of the beta together using like a multivariate normal distribution. Which is quite technical part. I want just like to say something about the discrepancy parameter. The discrepancy parameter, okay, the, the prior are more or less the same as before. Uh, we have just like to update the error variance in this way. Uh, this is like, I don't know, yeah, it's not possible to see, but I tell you just like how we, we devise like the discrepancy parameter. So we take all the possible differences in the maximum likelihood estimate of, for instance, using the t-test. We create an empirical distribution of the distance or the difference between the betas. Then we discretize Actually, we, we create the histogram. This should be like a most or less like a uniform. We take like a, the, this, the, the uh, histogram of this difference, and this should be like a, more or less like a distribution, in our opinion, of the discrepancy parameters. Uh, we discretize in these histograms in 20 bin, in 200 bins, and for every bins that we have here, we can calculate basically two high parameters that is important to define, which is the distance between the groups of, of, of the betas. It's quite technical, but the main idea here is instead of fixing 
uh, these two parameters, or like uh, the, the discrepancy parameter, uh, will allow them to be to be random. Then, like uh, the update is still nor is like a s still like a as before. Uh, the discrepancy parameter, the update is d is, do is done by a metropolis instance uh, using an empirical prior, as I told you before. Uh, the reversible general acceptance probability again here we impose again the same idea as before. So now for every group you have a beta, right? And you can have like a, for the first group like a, a some number of components for the first beta, uh, another number of components for the second beta and so on. We impose again that for all the matrix of the beta, which is dimension Ky times P, we have the same number of, of element. Um, and that is like easier because instead of working with K1 possible reversible jumps, we just work with uh, one. Uh, this is like the acceptance rate of, of when we condition on, on, for instance, this is the output that we obtain. When we condition on the number of components, which is the mode that I showed you before, this is like the number of components for the beta. Um, and we have just one reversible jump. So, you know, we are not very satisfied about like the mixing, but it doesn't matter uh, because as I told you later on, like the beta are quite well separated. And this is like the, the posterior distribution of a number of components. So the beta are around one, two, three, should be around three groups of, of beta. And I'll show you like uh, just this plot when, so Ky is equal to five. So we condition on the number of components for the, dim the uh, proteomics dimension reduction. Uh, then you have like uh, the, uh, the, uh, the beta for the first uh, regression to our, the, f the first, um, the first like uh, um, a group of, of, of uh, proteomics data condensed. And so this is like the, the trace of the mean, and this is like the trace of, of, the, uh, of, the, um, of the weights. As you can understand, and we, we as was expecting that, the majority of the beta that we obtained was near zero with a large weight. So this is all the groups of SNPs, basically, because we can see like on the allocation variable, which has no association with what I called before like the cluster gene. And this is like exactly instead the groups of, of SNPs which are associated with the first, the first um, uh, cluster gene. Okay, discussion. Um, um, well, it, it seems like quite complicated, but actually the idea, as I told you before, is the, the double application of, of, of mixture model, both for dimensional reduction and both for classification of the beta effect. Um, the acceptance, okay, there is a quite, quite important point that I, I I hide like uh, by purpose is like uh, the ordering that we choose when we do like the first dimensional reduction. Uh, I, I want to, I mean, there is like a problem of the ordering, but we, we probably would, the one that we choose, which is uh, the order by mean, is good for proteomics and transcriptomics. Probably it's not very good for metabonomics data. Um, well, I told you before that there was like also like a third variable, which is the disease status. Doesn't matter because I we can always like use like some, some theory that has better developed like many years ago. Uh, we can like transform like in a probability model the, the binary data and having a dimension reduction from KY, KY to KY plus one. So this is like all the times the component representing the disease status. Uh, finally, this is probably something that makes us like crazy in the next couple of weeks. We have a very rich output because you can imagine we can vary like the dimension of the Y matrix, and also we cluster according to this particular uh, configuration, the, the, um, the beta effect. Well, we have like to devise a good way like to represent very, this rich output in a sensible way, such that the, the, the biologists can understand quite, quite, quite like easily. I finished.